Welcome everybody to the Georgia Adopter Stream Bacterial Monitoring Workshop. Um, so our workshops are typically comprised of two parts. We have our classroom portion and we have our field portion. So uh, this right here is our classroom portion where we're just gonna go over some of the um, background as to why we do this kind of sampling and a little bit about how we go about um, doing bacterial monitoring. If you are looking to get fully certified, you do have to complete both the classroom and the field portion. So just being here doesn't exactly certify you as a bacterial monitor. But if you are looking to get you know, your full certification, then uh, we'd be more than happy to connect you with your local coordinator at the end of the session so that they can do the field portion with you. So just a little bit of a background on who we are. Um, we are Georgia adopt -a stream We are uh, Georgia's volunteer water quality monitoring program housed in the non-point source unit of the Environmental Protection Division of the Georgia Department, Department of Natural Resources. Big mouthful, all to say that we are a state agency. Um, and these are our program goals that are listed off in a handy dandy acronym, ADOPT. Um, so A stands for awareness. So we're trying to increase public awareness of water quality issues across the state of Georgia particularly non-point source pollution, which is the biggest threat to our state's water quality. D is for data. So we are looking to collect quality baseline water quality data. So when you go out into your stream and you take your samples and you submit that data into our online database, you are contributing to a long-term widespread data set that really helps us understand what our baseline conditions are in our waterways and when these conditions stray from normal. So by your submissions, you are contributing to a really robust database that's really helpful for us. O is observations. So this kind of ties into data in the sense that um, every time that you go out to your stream, regardless of what kind of monitoring you're doing, we ask that you take certain observations of your stream. And this helps you understand kind of what's changed and you know what seems abnormal to you you know, compared to what you usually go out and, and observe at your stream. P is partnerships. So we really encourage you to form partnerships with your local government agencies and water authorities and all that because they are excellent resources for, um, you know, any questions you might have, as well as if you are seeing something that is unusual or concerning at your stream, then you know who to call. And T finally is for tools and training. So this is what we are doing here today. We are giving you training and how to conduct bacterial monitoring. And we also have um, a way to provide you with tools, lending tools um, to go out into your stream or mo and to monitor. And we also can connect you with people if we are unable to lend those tools, um, connect you to people that can do so. Um, so yeah, today we are here for bacterial monitoring specifically, um, and we're going to go through how to collect your samples from your stream, how to plate those samples, and how to count the E. coli colonies that are on your plates. So E. coli is the only kind of bacteria that we are going to be looking at today. There are other kinds that exist in your stream, and um, we get this question all the time is, you know, do you, you know, look at this kind of bacteria or this one? We're just doing E. coli today. <laughs> um, and we'll explain a little bit more about why we went with E. coli and why it is important to look at this. But you know, the whole point of this type of monitoring is to determine if there is bacterial contamination in your water that can lead to health risks or declining stream health. Um, and E. coli is a very good indicator as to whether this kind of contamination is occurring. So everything that we do is in accordance to our EPA quality assurance project plan. Um, it is, you know, what we are, um, all the procedures and all the training that we do um, to ensure that all of our volunteers are getting the exact same information, they're doing the exact same techniques, so that our, um, our data is more reliable and accurate. Um, so once you go through one of these workshops, um, which should be the same as all the other workshops that are conducted um, as part of this program, um, you will become a QAQC, Quality Assured, Quality Controlled Volunteer. Um, only individuals can be certified. So if you're a teacher and you have a class, we're not going to certify, you know, eighth period. We're going to certify the teacher or the individual students. But the teacher can bring students out to the stream as long as he or she is certified. 
Um, the certification is valid for one year only. So once that year is up, volunteers have to go back and attend a recertification workshop so that they can continue collecting and entering data. Um, and only certif certified volunteers are able to submit data into our database. All right, so for volunteers to become certified as QA, QC, uh, they have to pass um, a few different um, components of this, of this whole training. So we have a uh, field and lab. Uh, volunteers must demonstrate how to properly collect and plate a sample while out in the field. And then volunteers must also pass a written exam. Um, I shouldn't say exam, it's more of like a quiz <laughs> with a score of at least 80%. And volunteers must correctly identify E. coli colonies and calculate the E. coli levels um, with an accuracy of at least 90%. And so, Cecilia, can you go to the next slide, this slide please? <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I know I had to kind of remember too. Oh, I'm not controlling it. Um, but anyway, sorry. Um, so what is a watershed? When you go out, and you are testing the water quality of your water body, you know, you're trying to, you're just looking at one small little piece of this big watershed. So a watershed is the land area which water, sediment, and dissolved materials drain to one common point. And that common point can be in a stream, um, a lake, a river, a wetland. Um, so if you think about it kind of like a cup, if you were to take your hands and cup them, um, the highest points of your hand, your fingertips, would be the boundaries of this watershed. And all of the water and sediment, everything that you would pour into your hands would fall to one common point. So that's just a visual for a watershed to help you out. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so when you go sample um, for your bacterial tests, you want to sample at your same site location, um, which is in a well mixed area of flowing water. You want to do this or try to do this at the same time of day and during normal flow conditions. Um, for bacterial testing, we will be running samples um, at least once a month. Uh, some safety considerations when you go out to sample, um, you know, do not sample alone. Um, if conditions are too dangerous to sample, you know, wait it out. Um, wait until a storm has stopped and the flow has returned to a normal flow. Um, you want to make sure you're wearing gloves and boots, um, especially if you're going to go, you know, do some bacterial sampling. You want to make sure you have um, gloves on because you just, you don't want to, <laughs> You know, some places are just really dirty, so you don't want to get, get too messy with that. Um, but you want to make sure you disinfect and dispose of your used sampling plates properly. And of course, you want to receive permission from a landowner, especially if your site is on private property. Yeah, so now that we've covered some of the background information, um, we'll talk a little bit more specifically about bacteria. So what are bacteria? They are single-celled living microscopic organisms. Um, they're teeny tiny, you can't see them with your eyes, and they are literally everywhere. Um, there are more bacteria on Earth than there are any other living thing. And they're found in all over the world in the most extreme environments that you can think of. They're in the trenches in the ocean, they're in glaciers, they're in your eyelashes, they're everywhere. <laughs> and although they usually get a bad rap, because when you think of bacteria, you think of, you know, infections or sickness, in truth, they're actually really, really important uh, when it comes to, you know, maintaining our, our existence. <laughs> So why are they so important? Um, so as a pers at a personal level, they can aid in a lot of our bodily functions. So digestion, for example, we have, you've probably heard the term like gut microflora, microbiome, that kind of thing. So those are your gut bacteria and we literally could not digest food without their existence. At a little bit of a greater level, um, they are incredibly important when it comes to nutrient cycling. 
So you may have heard of nitrogen fixing bacteria. They live in the soil and they pull nitrogen from the atmosphere and put it into the soil in a form um, that is available for plants to use. And uh, finally, they can be used to aid in pollution control. So they're commonly used in sewage treatment processes to remove excess nutrients from sewage and even combat harmful contaminants and stuff like that. Um, they can combat oil spills and a lot of other kind of pollutants. So super important, they literally make it possible for all life on earth to exist. So we like bacteria, but <laughs> of course there are some bad strains of bacteria, which you probably know about. Some of them are just problematic. So there are some in the soil that release toxins uh, as a form of competition to kill off other kinds of bacteria. And if we get in contact with them, it can make us sick. But that's kind of like a byproduct. However, there are certain kinds of bacteria that are specifically, specifically designed to cause disease in humans, animals, plants, you name it. And these are called pathogenic bacteria. These are the ones we're gonna be looking at because these are the disease-causing bacteria that we really don't wanna encounter. So when we're thinking of E. coli, which is the one that we're going to be looking at specifically, it comes under this umbrella of coliform bacteria. So coliform bacteria is a very broad um, classification. It's a biological family of bacteria. It covers a lot of different stuff. But underneath that is the fecal coliforms, which are a subgroup of these coliforms that are found in the intestinal tracts of humans and other warm-blooded animals like you know dogs and cattle and birds and all that good stuff. So it's, you know, comes out in our waste. And an even smaller subset of fecal coliform is our E. coli. So this is a subgroup um, and it makes up about 60% of our fecal coliforms. And this is what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the presentation are these E. coli. So why is that? Why do we want to monitor for E. coli? Well, E. coli are an excellent indicator species. Uh, and while there are harmful strains of E. coli, um, it often serves more as an indicator for the presence of pathogens in our water. Um, and so if you see, if you find E. coli in your stream, there's a good chance that there's going to be other harmful bacteria existing in your stream. So some of the sources of E. coli in our waterways uh, include wildlife. Um, so if you go sample for, you know, if you, if you take your samples in an area where there's a bunch of geese hanging around, you're probably gonna have pretty high E. coli levels. Um, so you kind of don't wanna take your samples around them. Uh, livestock, so if there's a stream right next to a cattle pasture or if the cows are literally in the stream like they are in this picture, you're gonna have higher levels of E. coli. Um, and then urban storm runoff is, um, you know, everything that washes after rain um, comes from urban areas and it can often contain like dog poop if people aren't picking up after their dogs. And all of that goes into the storm drains, which, by the way, go directly into your stream. They do not go to a wastewater treatment plant. Anything that goes into a storm drain is going straight into your stream. So anything that washes off, you know, out of those dog parks or whatever that goes into those storm drains is going straight into your river. And finally, leaking pipes and failing septic systems, that's just human sewage. <laughs> so there's a pretty strong relationship between E. coli levels and whether or not there has been a rainstorm recently. So like we were talking about, with all that water washing over the land, I mean, it could, you know, like I said, wash over a dog park, over a cattle field, any of that stuff. Once that goes into the river after this big rainfall event, then you're going to have a spike in E. coli. There's a pretty strong correlation in that, um, which is one of the reasons why you don't want to sample after a heavy rain event for E. coli, like Jackie mentioned at the beginning. Additionally, E. coli counts are typically a lot higher in the summer compared to the winter, and this is because the replication rates for E. coli and a lot of other kinds of bacteria are just higher when it's warmer. So if you think about putting your food in the refrigerator versus leaving it in your car for three days, the food in the refrigerator is gonna last a lot longer because whatever bacteria is in there and it's in there is not replicating nearly as fast as that potato salad you left in your car for three days. It's pretty gross. Okay, so 
We went ahead and took the whole protocol for monitoring and sampling your E. coli and broke it down into six steps. Just an overview slide of the six steps that we'll go into further detail um, as I go through. So next slide, please. All right, first step, um, preparing your blank or your control. Uh, so creating a blank uh, is just a way to check and see if the sampling methods allow for contamination. So a blank is a sampling plate that when you incubate it, there will be no bacterial growth on it whatsoever. All right, so there should be nothing growing on this blank. And the way we do that is we will take a Whirlpack bag. So a Whirlpack is just a plastic sealed bag that we use to collect our water samples. And you wanna label this as your blank. So you see here we have a, just a little picture. You'll write blank, you'll write the date that you're sampling and the time of that sample. You still wanna make sure when you are um, preparing your blank that you wear gloves and that you remove the perforated seal on the bag. Um, and you can do that by, you'll just tear it open, and then there's small white tabs on both sides of the bag, and you can just pull them, and that keeps you from, you know, getting your fingers accidentally inside of it and possibly um, contaminating the bag. You'll wanna make sure you fill the world pack about two thirds of the way with distilled water, and that you can, you know, bring bring from home, you can go buy it at the store. Um, if you're working at a lab, uh, you should have distilled water um, on hand for that too. And then you whirl. So I wish I had a whirl pack to show you um, the whirl because it's a lot of fun, but um, it, it's not gonna have the same effect with, with me doing it in thin air. But yeah, you just kinda, you just twist it. Um, you hold it by the, tabs, the yellow tabs on the side, and you want to look away and just twist, spin the bag in the air, and that will seal it up. And you twist tie the bag closed, and you will place the blank in a sanitized cooler on ice, and that is that cooler is where you're going to store all of your other samples. So when you go to your site and you're going to collect your sample, you're gonna use one world pack to sample upstream from yourself. You wanna clearly label this sample bag with the name of your site location, the date, and the time you are collecting. After you scoop up your sample, you whirl, and you seal it up, you wanna place it into your cooler um, immediately after collecting. And you wanna make sure this cooler is out of the way of any UV light because UV will decrease the bacterial levels in your sample. You wanna plate the sample as soon as you can, but you can keep the, the sample on ice for no more than 24 hours. So step number three is plating your sample. Before you plate, you wanna make sure you clean your work area with disinfectant spray. And you'll have your bag, your imaginary bag. I should have prepared a Ziploc bag now that I think about this, I'm so sorry. But um, you'll have your bag and you wanna make sure you invert it a few times to make sure that everything that's in there is just floating freely. And then you're going to prepare your 3M Petrofilm plates. Now, these plates are, you know, you have to, they're specially made, the medium, that you have to make sure that they're, you're not using them past their expiration date. Um, so check those before you start to plate. You also wanna make sure that your plates are at room temperature because um, we'll go into this a little bit later, but you can store your plates in the refrigerator or freezer. Um, so if you do do that, you wanna make sure you leave them out beforehand at room temperature. Um, and then you're going to label your plates, one as a blank, and then you're gonna run triplicates for your site. So a triplicate means you're gonna have three different sample plates. 
and then you'll have your fourth as a blank. So four plates total. Step number four is incubating your sample plates. So with our volunteers and for us in the office, we just use a like a chicken egg incubator. So these are very lightweight. They're, you know, they have, they're made up of styrofoam, um, but they have a digital thermometer that stays inside. And usually what we do is we turn this on early on so that our incubator gets to a stable temperature um, reading with the thermometer inside. So this reading is going to be 35 degrees Celsius um, and you have room up or lesser than um, a degree and you want to incubate this for 24 hours plus or minus an hour. And you want to make sure that you're checking the minimum and the maximum temperatures um, because sometimes the temperatures can fluctuate but um, incubators, you can adjust the temperature um, using the metal dials that are on the um, device. So after 24 hours, your plates will have growth on them. Um, so when you're reading your results, remember we're only counting E. coli colonies. We, we only care about the presence of E. coli. So when you see a plate, it will have red colonies growing and blue colonies. We only wanna count the blue colonies with entrapped gas bubbles. So you'll see here in this graphic, we have different examples of what entrapped gas bubbles may look like. Um, so they can be surrounding the growth, they can you know, be emerging from it. There's all these different patterns that you can see, but we're only counting blue colonies with with gas bubbles. When we report the E. coli colonies, we're gonna use a standard reporting unit of CFU per 100 milliliter. So that just means colony forming units per 100 milliliters. We also wanna make sure we do not count colonies that are growing more than halfway off the medium. So as Jackie mentioned, we are get, you have to set up a blank whenever you are doing um, bacterial monitoring, and this is what your blank should look like. It shouldn't look any different than when you first put that DI water on it. It shouldn't grow anything. You know, even even the red um, general call form colonies, like you don't want any of that. It needs to look like this. If it doesn't, then that means that you need to go back up to your stream and collect another sample and do it all over again because if this has stuff on it, then that means that there's some sort of contamination in your samples and that makes them invalid, so sorry. Um, now we're gonna go through and, um, and see if you guys can figure out how many E. coli colonies are on each of these. So yeah, we've got a poll up, so please vote for how many E. coli colonies you can count. And remember, it's blue with entrapped gas bubbles around them, blue. The bubbles. Boats are coming in. All right. So it looks like we got 14. So I would say it's actually a little bit closer to 12. Um, because is my, is my mouse over on the plate? I can't tell because I'm in the No, I can't it's see your not. mouse. Okay. No. Well, there's one in the bottom right hand corner that looks like it is, it has blue and it has a gas bubble, but, um, as Jackie mentioned, it is actually halfway off of the plate. So we're not going to count that. 
And then there's one all the way over to the left with a gas bubble, but that one is red. So we're not gonna count that one either. So all the other ones that you see, all right, there's one also, there's a red one with a gas bubble kind of to the right um, middle-ish. Um, that is also not countable, but everything else is. So we would say about 12. However, all of these are pretty close to each other. So if you got somewhere between 13 or like 12 to 14, to 14 it's pretty close. You know, we're not gonna dock you for having one more or less, you know. All right, next slide. And I'll say too that in real life, when you have an actual plate, the colors are so much more distinct. It is hard with, you know, seeing it on the screen and, um, you know, on paper too, it can be hard. But when you actually have a plate, it's easier to see. Uh, so our second example, let's see, how many E. coli colonies? Let's try to count them. This one's got a lot. All right, so we got 18 and we got one for 20. I would say it's a little bit closer to 20, but it is kind of hard to see on here because there's one that's on the edge that has a little bit of a bubble um, up on the top right. And then I would count one on the bottom left, not both of them because I believe that the other one is kind of starting to go off the, um, the plate. But again, 18 or 20, I would accept either one of those answers, so, um, so good job. There we go. Oh. All right, so this is something that we haven't talked about yet. Um, and after y'all answer, and we're not gonna ask you to count every single one of these, um, just, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it in a second. Five more seconds. All right, great. So almost all of you said too numerous to count. This is a technical definition for when it looks like this. It is literally too many to count. You cannot distinguish them from each other. When it gets to this like purple looking color on here, looks like like blackberry jam, but don't eat it. Uh, <laughs> that's when it is what we call TNTC, too numerous to count. If you're seeing this, you should contact somebody pretty quick because you probably are, you know, detected some sort of sewage spill or, you know, a lot of E. coli in your river. So TNTC. Yep. All right. Sorry. So our fourth example.
Great, yeah, so <laughs> everyone got the right answer. There you go, so three. Um, Cecilia, I think if you hit the next slide, then the little note memo will pop uh, up. Ah, yes. There yes. we go, yes, okay. <laughs> so yeah, so this is just a reminder, you know, we do not count the blue colonies without gas bubbles, so you all caught that. Very well good. done. <laughs> all right, next one. You have a pull up. All right, so we got a little bit of a range of answers on this round. So the correct answer is two. Um, and this is because, so the two um, colonies with air bubbles on the right half of the plate are E. coli colonies. The two with air bubbles on the left half of the plate are just general coliform colonies that happen to have air bubbles. So these are red, it's a little bit hard to see on the screen, but the red ones will typically be smaller and more uniformly shaped compared to the blue ones. Um, those ones are typically bigger, so that's kind of an, a good way of figuring out which one is which. Um, and again, like Jackie said, it's a lot easier when you have real plates in front of you than it is on this screen. But yeah, so the correct answer is two. All right. All right, so very good. All right, so the correct answer is three. So good job. Uh, it does look like, you know, if you see four blue colonies there in that kind of diagonal line, but the one at the very top left does not have any air bubbles. So again, we just count blue with air bubbles. Right, let's do one. The votes are rolling in. <laughs> Amazing. We got one hundred percent TNTC. It is the forbidden jam. All right. All right, example number eight. All right, so we had, all right, so most of you picked the right answer. Yes, um, it, there is only one E. coli colony on this plate. All the rest of them are red general coliform colonies, even if they do have uh, air bubbles. All right, this is a two-parter.
right, awesome. So this one was a bit tricky. So this is our blank. And if you guys remember, you should not be seeing anything on your blank. Um, so this one actually does not have any E. coli colonies on it at all. These are the ones that you see with the air bubbles are just general call form. They're not E. coli, they're red, not blue. Um, but regardless of the fact that there are no E. coli colonies, there is still bacteria on this plate. And so that would mean that it is not acceptable as a blank because there is something on here that should not be on here. There, sh there shouldn't be anything on here. So if you saw this as your blank, then you need to go back to your stream and, uh, and resample. All right, here's another one for you. All right, very good, you guys. All right, so yes, the correct answer is four. You'll see that we have four blue colonies growing within the boundaries of our medium, and those four have air bubbles. All right, so we're not gonna do a poll for this one because this one is pretty weird, and this is kind of our exception to our rule. So this one has about 60 colonies on there, and we did take the time to count. Um, <laughs> but, um, it's too few to be TNTC because as you can see, you can still differentiate, you know, some of the um, blue colonies. You can still tell them apart. They're not all just like one purple blob, but there are a lot on here. And as you can see, a lot of them don't have air bubbles on them. And normally, as we would say, we would not count those as, uh, as E. coli. We wouldn't count those in our results. But in this case, when you have this deep red color and this many E. coli colonies on there, there's literally not enough room for air bubbles to form. And so we tell people to count all blue colonies as E. coli colonies. So that's why we're saying that this one is about 60. Um, and, uh, and this is the guidance that is provided by the, uh, the manufacturer. So it's a very weird case. And it's the only time that we would ever tell you to count blue colonies when there aren't gas bubbles. All right. Last example. <laughs> yeah. One more for you. All right, very good. So yeah, most of you got it. Uh, it's four. Um, you see them, they're all on the right side of the plate. The one that is over on the left with air bubbles around it, that is red in color. Um, so that's what makes it different and not counted. Hey, you guys did great. All right, we're gonna talk to you now about, if I can change the slide, about how to calculate the results from your plates. So as you remember, you take three plates per one sample. So you have your world pack and you're gonna do three plates from that one bag. And so now we're gonna calculate the results that you get from three different plates. So um, here is our example. We have on plate one, we have three colonies, plate two has two and plate three has three. So we're gonna take the sum of plate one, two, and three and divide it by the number of plates, which is three. And that's gonna get your average colony forming units per one milliliter. So the reason why it's one milliliter is because that's how much water you're putting on your plate. You're not putting 100 mils on your plate. That'd be like the whole table. Um, and then so to get your actual colony forming units per 100 milliliters, you're gonna multiply that average that you got by 100 milliliters, and that's gonna get your colony forming units per 100 mils. So let's do it with some real numbers. So those plates that we saw at the beginning, it was three, two, and three. So that's gonna be three plus two plus three, that's eight, divided by three, 
and that's going to be 2.67 colony forming units per one milliliter. And then you're going to take that 2.67 and multiply it by 100 milliliters, and then you're going to get 267 colony forming units per 100 milliliters. And that is your final result from that, um, that sampling session. So if y'all remember, we have those T and TC plates, the ones with a lot of E. coli on there. So it's kind of weird because this isn't a real number. So how do we go about calculating our results for T and TC? Well, the answer is that it's T and TC. It's pretty easy, actually. So, you know, since they are just kind of a general number um, above 150 colonies, again, we're not asking you to count that high. There's no way of actually having a real number answer. And so it's literally just still TNTC. I will say, and we get this question a lot, if you get like one TNTC and two normal, like, you know, low levels or something like that, or two TNTC and one low level, that should not happen. You shouldn't have that happen, you know, in your results. So either they're all TNTC or none of them are TNTC. If you have one or two that are TNTC, then you need to redo that because there's some kind of problem with either your incubation or your sampling or, or something like that. All right, so now that you have collected and incubated and read all your results and everything like that, it's time to clean up. Um, so what you're gonna do is you're going to spray down your, um, your plates with some sort of disinfectant, so bleach or Lysol or something like that and then seal them in a Ziploc bag, or you can use one of your old Whirlpack bags. Um, the water that's in the Whirlpacks that you collected your samples from can go straight down the drain. The, it's, that drain's gonna go either to your septic tank or your wastewater treatment plant, and both of those have seen a lot worse than some stream water, so it's totally good to put that down the drain, or you could even water your plants with it. Um, that's always nice. But yeah, so you can put those uh, disinfected plates into your bag, seal it up, and throw them away. And also, you're gonna want to spray down your incubator with disinfectant and probably all the surfaces around your incubator too. This is bacteria, wear gloves, just, you know, you don't want it in the house really. And wash your hands once you're done. Okay, so when it comes to storing our Petrofilm, uh, you can store it for in, I'm sorry, you can store it in the refrigerator if you're going to use it within the month. But if you just went ahead and bought, you know, a bulk order and you're not going to be using it for a while, um, then you can keep it in the freezer for storage. Um, and like I said before, we want to make sure though, when we pull those out of the refrigerator or freezer, that we just thaw them to room temperature before we use them for uh, plating. Okay, so EPA has their recommended E. coli levels for recreational waters. So when you go, if you wanna go um, you know, tubing or swimming over in the river or the lake, they're gonna have standards set in place um, depending on you know, if the E. coli levels fall within here, then you know, this water is okay for swimming, or maybe no, you should, you know, just re refrain from swimming in that. So these are posted here, and these were taken from, uh, from the US EPA, uh, I can't read that at the bottom, but- um, 1986. See, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so the EPA, they designate um, safe levels of E. coli for swimming if it's below 235, so you know the units here are 235 CFU per 100 milliliter. Um, moderate swimming is less than 298. Light swimming in that area is if the levels are um, 410 or less. An uh, infrequent swimming area is 576. And we're going to bring up this slide. Um, the, you know the difference between fecal and E. coli, you know, when you're sampling and reading because EPA in the state of Georgia, when they take their samples, they are uh, collecting for just fecal coliform. So those number, the numbers that they 
post represent fecal coliform numbers. Um, according to EPA, approximately 60% of total fecal coliform uh, is represented by E. coli. So, for example, if they post a fecal coliform sample um, of 1,000 CFUs per 100 milliliter, then 60% of that is approximately 600 CFUs per 100 milliliters of E. coli. All right, so what level are we concerned with here at Adopt a Stream? If your reading is greater than 1,000 CFUs per 100 milliliters of E. coli, then that um, you know, warrants some action. So if you get a reading that is 1,000 CFUs or higher, then your next step would be to investigate the site. Um, you know, walk up and down your site. Um, you should be already familiar with your watershed or, you know, do a site assessment. So, um, you know, possibly identifying possible sources of E. coli. And you just want to continue monitoring the site. So, you know, continue running samples. If you get, you know, more readings that are below the threshold, then that's okay, you can just continue monitoring. But if you keep getting readings that are above this threshold, then that is when it's time to notify uh, those partners. So, um, you know, notify your local health agency or water authority. Um, and once you notify those authorities, then they can go out to collect a regulatory leveled sample um, to get further action. All right, <clears throat> so um, just kind of you know, wrapping up here, we're gonna talk a little bit about the data sheet that you're going to use when you go out monitoring. So um, this is the bacterial form for Adopt-A-Stream and the top part is what is on all of the monitoring program data sheets. This is your site information, weather and observations. You're gonna do this regardless of what kind of monitoring you are going out and doing. The bottom part is bacterial specific. So we will go through the form a little bit. So like I mentioned at the very beginning, every time that you go out to your stream, you are going to collect observations. That is the O in adopt. Please collect observations whenever you're out. And uh, some of those observations include flow and water level. So if it's rained recently or if you're in a drought, you're gonna have very different levels for that. Uh, water color and clarity are actually really great um, to use your world pack for. So when you go out, you can collect a sample in your world pack, and it's a lot easier to see how clear the water is and what color it is by looking through a clear bag just straight through, as opposed to looking down at your stream, because you're gonna see the stream bed when you just look into the stream itself. So it's gonna kind of mess with your mind a little bit. It's kind of hard to tell what color and how clear it is when you're looking at, you know, a muddy bottom stream or, or you know, rocks on the bottom or stuff like that. Uh, the water surface is, you're gonna look to see if there's any sort of oily sheen on it, if there's algae, um, foam, any of that stuff. Um, so it says photos here. We don't actually have a way to upload photos to our database, but it is a good way to keep record of your, your stream and you know, taking photos every time you go out and looking at them all through, you can see how your stream has changed over time a lot better than your memory can kind of serve. Um, and we are working on um, updating our database so that we can accept photos, hopefully in the near future. Uh, and then finally, we have a spot to mark if there is trash at your site and uh, if you believe that there should be a cleanup done. So here is the bacterial specific part of the data form. And I know that some of y'all mentioned that you are also chemical monitors. So if you are doing both bacterial and chemical monitoring, there is actually a combo data form that has both chemical and bacterial sections. So you can fill them both out on one data sheet. It's very handy dandy. Um, but this is just the bacterial section. So, um, you know, you have your section over here with all of the colonies on your one, two, three plates, your triplicate of plates, and your blank, which again should always be zero. If it's not zero, you have to do it again. 
Um, and then you can do your calculation on here uh, and also fill out all of your information to do with your incubation um, practices. And if you do, or if you're kind of unsure as to, you know, what you're seeing on your plates and stuff like that, feel free to um, take pictures or scan them um, and send us or your local coordinator pictures and we'll do our best to help you out and um, uh, figure out what you're looking at. So once you have collected all of your data, we please ask that you submit it as soon as possible to our online database. That is at adoptastream.georgia.gov. Um, and uh, yeah, get it in as soon as you can. And so just a little bit of a walkthrough on how you actually submit data onto our database. So this is our home screen and you'll go to data entry, data submission form, click on that. And it'll take you to this form, which you can fill out. It starts on the site information. So you'll fill out all of the information for your site, like your you know, group number, your site number, all that, the weather conditions and those observations that we talked about. You have to fill all of this out first and then click submit at the bottom of the page, scroll all the way down, click submit before you can enter any other data, you know, bacterial, chemical, whatever it be. So submit your site data first, and then you can click on the tab at the top for bacterial, and it'll take you to the bacterial form. And so you just fill all that out straight from your data sheet and, uh, and click submit. And you have to come, have to click submit for each um, tab whenever you're entering data. So if you have chemical, bacterial, and site data, you have to click submit for each one of those. There's no submit all, unfortunately, but, um, but yeah. And uh, this is a really cool um, graphic that just shows how volunteer monitoring data is used. So we just want to let you know that your data is not going into a void. It's not just sitting in a cabinet. It is actually being used um, you know, for educational purposes and like we talked about at the beginning, establishing those baseline conditions. Like five scientists could not go out and collect all the data that you guys do. So it's so important to have your feet on the ground in the field and it really is useful and, and, and so helpful for all of these different reasons um, uh, and probably even more. <laughs> so these are some helpful links um, for uh, on our website. If you are trying to get started um, monitoring for adopt a stream, so the first one is finding your local coordinator. Um, so these are folks that um, you know are uh, trained to you know provide you resources and help. Um, uh, sorry, um, and uh, and they're really really great tools for you to use. Um, we also have a page getting started with adopt a stream, which walks you through the process of how to get involved with Adopt a Stream and what you need to do, and our volunteer FAQs, um, which we are more than happy to accept your you know, questions and, and answer anything that we can, but this is a really great place to um, get started if you have a question, um, to just check out this page first um, and then shoot us an email. Um, so this is the Find Your Local Coordinator page on our website, like we just talked about. Um, it's laid out by the region and then um, the service area, the coordinator, and their contact information, as well as the organization that they're working for. So I know that we had some people on the coast um, at, at this uh, workshop today. So this one has our coastal Georgia people listed out. So if you see your county on there, you can scroll over and find your coordinator and shoot them an email if you have questions or if you're just looking to get started. Um, so yeah. Now we'll go ahead and, uh, and take any of your questions. This is our our contact info, our website, our email, and our um, social media links, as well as our, um, our address. So yeah, we'll go ahead and, uh, and get out of here and uh, answer any questions you might have. Thanks, y'all, for sharing all that info. Um, I know we do have a couple questions. I can go ahead and get us started. So. Um, Latasha wanted us to go back to the third step of plating. So that's plating your sample. She said she just kind of wanted to look over that slide really quick. I think that. Um... There we go. 
And yeah, there is a place on our <laughs> on our website where you can access those. So if you go to that Georgia Adopt a Stream or adoptstream.georgia.gov um, and you go to uh, workshop presentations, it's under materials and resources, you can access all these PowerPoints there as well, Latasha. <clears throat> Any uh, other questions? Yeah. So, um, Kathy wants to know: Are our three and Petra foam plates? Are they just made? Um, <clears throat> sorry, auger plates. Um. <laughs> so they have a similar kind of medium, but it's it's more specific to growing E. coli colonies than just a plain auger plate. So this one is specifically for E. coli. So it can help you identify whether or not there is E. coli in your sample, not just generally bacteria like an auger plate would. Yes, and it has dye in there. That's why the, um, the E. coli plates turn, or the E. coli colonies, excuse me, turn that dark blue color. They're specifically designed to have that dye in there. Yeah. We have, um, ooh, excuse me, we have uh, the, information for like purchasing or you know finding these 3m plates on our website so we're always happy to share that uh, resource for you um, with you if you're interested in getting the plates yourself yeah i'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing um wesley wants to know is it one drop per plate so how many how much of each sample are we putting on each plate yeah, so like Cecilia said, um, you're going to be pipetting just one milliliter of the sample water from the World Pack bag. It's just one yeah. milliliter. Your pipette, you know, should have some sort of way to measure how much if you're using it, an actual pipette, not just a little dropper, you'll be able to see that you're putting one milliliter on. And we want to make sure that that's exactly one mil on, uh, on all of our samples. Yeah, and just to kind of loop back in um, Kathy's question from before we got started, Kathy was asking, is there a recommended bacteria kit that someone can purchase to do on their own? Um, we have a monitoring checklist with all of our equipment on it. Um, I can post a link in the chat that just can direct you to, it's a PDF that you download. Um, we do have some materials that we recommend. So one of them would be that um, pipette that they mentioned, because just using a little, um, a little dropper is not gonna be as accurate as we need to be for this calculation or for this protocol. So um, having that pipette, having an incubator, and these three M petrofilm plates are um, things that we will need. So I can drop that in there in the chat. Are there any further questions? Y'all did so great on the uh, identifying. Experiment. Yeah, I know. I was super impressed. I'm very impressed because those are hard. I was making the polls and I was having to like get really close <laughs> to the screen and count each one. So y'all did so great, especially if this is like your first time seeing them. It's pretty it seems kind of random, like why are we only counting blue ones? Why do they have to have gas bubbles and all of those things? But y'all did a great job. Yeah. Probably because you have wonderful teachers here today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, um, I guess if there are no further questions, um, we'll just have a few closing remarks and reminders. So uh, if you have not already, please join our Confluence 2020 Facebook group. Uh, to keep up to date with some of the upcoming sessions and connect with our fellow conference attendees. Um, and Jackie, would you mind telling us a little bit about our silent auction? Yes, so our silent auction is going on this month. Um, you can place your bids throughout the month, go and browse the items. Uh, I will, the link for that will be posted here. Oh, there it is. Um, so the link for the silent auction is in the chat. And we have many really great items out right now. Some tickets to the zoo, um, some Brave season or so, uh, Braves tickets, uh, winery packages. So there's a little 
little something for everybody. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, so once, uh, once you leave this webinar, you will be directed to a page that will ask you to participate in a quick five question post-session survey. So please fill out the survey and let us know how we can improve and you know what you liked and what you didn't like and all that. Um, and as always, if you have any questions about Adopt a Stream um, or you know have any specific questions about this session or want to sign up for our newsletter, any of that, uh, please feel free to shoot us an email and that is also in the chat. So yeah. And we do have one more upcoming workshop. Next week, uh, we have our macro invertebrate workshop, which is our last one of Confluence. Um, and it is on August 24th at 5 p.m. So 5 p.m., correct? Yes. So uh, so we hope to see you guys there if you uh, you haven't uh, checked out macro before. Yeah. Even if you have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I will say if you're interested in getting um, your full certification, so connecting with that local coordinator. I know they might have already said this, but just want to reiterate that we are more than happy to connect you with that person. And if that person isn't able to, um, you know, maybe work with you because of restrictions with their job on coronavirus or anything like that, we're more than happy to make arrangements with you, um, get you out in the field, get some practice, social distance style, and then um, get that certification test under your belt. So please just follow up with that email that's in the chat. And um, yeah, we're happy to help. So thanks, y'all. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for everyone for coming today. Uh, and we uh, hope to see you at some Confluence sessions uh, for the next couple weeks. we got two more weeks of sessions left. So, um, so yeah, we hope to see you there. Thanks, y'all.